Appreciate you all being here this morning. We're going to be starting our study of Revelation. Um, for me, uh, this week was fun because it's not often I get to dust off my history books from my shelf and actually get to use my degree, but I got to use it this week, so I was very excited. Um, it's always a good week when I get to read Eusebius, Ignatius, uh, Polycarp, and Clement all in the same novel. <laughs> So, I'm not going to make anyone raise your hand, but I've been talking about this for several weeks now, so hopefully, no, yes, you all have read through it, or at least listened to it. Some of you have legitimate excuses, um, like Rochelle had a baby, you know, that's a legitimate excuse. Anyway, um, hopefully, you all have done that to some degree. Appreciate, Zach, you organizing that class on Monday, and, and um, if, you, if you missed it, uh, hopefully, you know, in the future there'll be another opportunity and do something like that. So, today, before we jump in, I just want to preface once again, these next couple weeks are going to be information heavy and I'm front-loading the class, okay? And this is so we can lay the groundwork so when we get to the text of the Revelation, uh, we can discuss its meaning its impact and its practical application for us today because I have a firm conviction that Revelation should, is actually one of the most uh, relevant and applicable books that we're going to read in an ever-increasing secular culture, okay? Um, and we'll get into that in just a minute. So before we start, we do want to go to God in word of prayer. And Zach, would you lead us in that word? Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning, for your blessing of allowing us to wake and to arrive safely to this building. We pray that you be with our hearts and our minds on our focus as we begin a study of the book of Revelation, that we would be eager to learn more about your word, to understand it further. Thank you for the group that meets here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. One thing I did forget, and I will partially take blame, although I was here 10 minutes early, um, the note cards, the 3 by 5 were not out there. If you were early bird, they are now. Um, if you would like one, uh, just raise your hand, and the two of the deacons can come through and get you one of these, or two of them, or three. Um, so what I'm asking is, you do not have to ask it today in class. You don't even have to ask it in class. But if you do have questions, which I know you do, I would request you write down your top one or two, legibly, please. Uh, and I'm going to, I don't know what the opposite of dating is, you know, because I'm going to say something that just shows my ignorance. I cannot read really fluid cursive. I can read cursive, but not really fluid cursive. So I'm going to request y'all print, um, or at least very legibly. Um, and that's my fault. The reason why I'm asking for this is two, two things, really. Uh, one, it lets me know what your questions are. And two, it lets me actually address them at the appropriate time when they come up and actually have a more informed answer on this. But it's not if you have questions. It's what are your questions when it comes to this book. So uh, we're going to have an opportunity today to talk about some of them. No answers necessarily today, but us just kind of see where we're all at on that, and then um, we'll go from there. So if you need these note cards, raise your hand. The deacons can get you some or pick them up on the way out. As long as I have these at some point in the next couple weeks, that'll be good. Um, because actually, what if you have the handout... Um, I think, where'd I put it? Yeah, around at the end of the 13th lesson, where the, there's the interlude in the book, chapter 10, I actually have a scheduled a, a Q&A session, more or less. We're going to have those kind of built in. That way we're not waiting to the very end to address everything. So there'll be opportunities to do that. And you might have new ones that come along as, as that happens. So if you do have additional ones that come up, please email them to me. Um, if you tell me, I will forget it, and that is a promise. Uh, <laughs> I just, I, I cannot, with everything else going on, I need it in writing, preferably an email, so I can see it before me. So, 
Okay, now before we even get to the introduction stuff, I do want to go over a few things. I really appreciate everyone's comments in class lately. It's been great. I love how it's building on each other. Uh, I think we need to lay down some new parameters just so we can respect everybody's comments and make sure we have enough time to get to the, through the material and that. So, when it comes to making comments in class, I'm going to ask all of us to be concise with our comments, okay? Uh, James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Know this, my beloved brothers, but everyone must be quick to hear, so to speak, so to anger. For an anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Now, the principle here is that everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak. Um, you know, think, has this comment already been made? Has this question already been asked? Am I going to be contributing to the class? Just, just think a little bit before we make the comment. Not that your comments haven't been great. It's just we have a lot to get through, and there's going to be a lot to talk about, about Revelation. So really think there before we speak here. And that goes to the second point. Be thoughtful with your answers, okay? In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word is good for building up or edification what is needed, so it might give grace to those who hear. Um, I knew of a brother a couple congregations ago that love him to death, but when his hand went up and they got called on, I knew for the next 10 minutes it was just going to be noise. And finally he'd get to the point, okay? Um, love the brother, love his enthusiasm, uh, but a little forethought can concise down that comment into one or two sentences or something, okay? And then thirdly, oop, let's rely on the scriptures for truth. So if we're going to say the scriptures teach, let's make sure we try and have the Bible verse ready to go with that, okay? And if you don't know the Bible verse, the good question is, well, I think it says this somewhere. I don't know where it's at. Could you help me? Okay. Um, there's, um, I've been in Bible classes where statements will get thrown out without any support, and we just kind of move on from that. And a little point here, when we have visitors, the, the, this last thing is super important. When we have visitors, it's octuply important, okay? Um, because they may not have known, they don't know the, they may not know the truth. They may not understand the reasoning. So if you can show from the scripture where that point's being proven, that's a big, it, it, we should be doing that anyway, okay? And especially when it comes to the revelation. So um, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25. Now, I'm not going to read these every time in class, but this will be up on the board just about every class we have um, as a reminder, okay? And we read here in verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men, okay? So we should be trying to cite and source all of our answers, all of our I think so's biblically, okay? Um, so that being said, our goal for today, our goals, I just want to see what our biggest questions are, okay? I want to see what our biggest questions are. I want to see what our challenges are, or at least our perceived challenges, right? Uh, because some congregations, how they study the New Testament, they start Matthew and they go all the way through Jude, and we go back to Matthew. By the way, we do this, sometimes we do the same thing with the Old Testament. We'll do Genesis all the way through the histories. Oh, Isaiah, and back to Genesis. We have an aversion to the prophets, and we have an aversion to Revelation that shouldn't be. Uh, because as Paul says in Ephesians 4, um, God gave some of us apostles and prophets and teachers and pastors, the prophets are still relevant for us, and the revelation is still relevant for us. So we want to see what our biggest challenges are, and if we've read through the book, I hope you have, I just want to talk about what our initial impressions are. Because revelation is extremely impressionable. Um, and I do not mean it's subject to other people's whims. I mean it, it's supposed to leave you with an impression. Um, Revelation, as it's kind of designed, think of it as a movie in four parts, or a play in four acts. Um, in a time before, you know, Michael Bay directing the latest blockbuster, uh, the revelation is vivid for a reason. It's supposed to evoke the imagination, and it's supposed to evoke the emotions in response to what is being described in the revelation, okay? Um, so, 
I've talked enough. Those are our goals for today. Uh, so let's just start off. Okay, I misread that to begin with. I'm, the slide's right. What's your initial questions? Oh no. You gotta have something, right? Andy? I read somewhere, I forget, I, I, I can't find, I can't find where in Revelation, but I read Revelation would give a checklist of all the people who will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm. Okay, so you're asking if it, if it teaches that. Okay, so that's not really a question, then that's a statement then. Okay, we're asking for questions. I appreciate you sharing, though. Questions? Dennis? Here we, are, here we all have questions, but as you stated, slow speak, all that kind of, about James 1 and 19. I think some of the questions you're going to answer as we go through this, so instead of me just, like I said, spitballing or whatever you want to call it, because for me, as I, and yes, I have listened to a lot of this book, as you stated. Mm -hmm. And you know, for me, like I said, just correct me if I'm wrong, but the word for revelation in Greek is apocalypsis, right? Mm -hmm. It's a revelation. It's not anything that's hidden. Mm -hmm. It is meant to be understood as it states in the first chapter when it, those who read and understand. So there's nothing hidden, as you stated. I don't know why there's that fear or why we double back when we hit Job and never get into Revelation. Because for me, for me, Brendan, a lot of this is Caesar or Christ. Mm -hmm. Who am I going to worship? Because we understand that there was a lot of things going on at that time with the our brothers and sisters. Right. So something to your comment there. Okay. Ignore what I said just a moment ago, okay? On comments, yes, let's be thoughtful, but questions, I, I want the raw questions. I want the, un, well, maybe not completely unfiltered, but I want the raw questions, okay? Because what we're doing here for me as the teacher is I'm gauging where y'all's understanding is at. And I'm gauging where we have gaps. So I can make sure this class is as impactful and edifying as possible. So, give me the questions. Steve, you had one. When I studied Revelations, I had a really hard time until I went back and, and studied really hard to understand books like Ezekiel and Daniel. Because the same kind of sim symbolic language is used in them, but in them you get the completion of it. You get you get the actual word spoken, and you see the results. So you see what the what God meant when Daniel said this, or when Ezekiel said that, or when Isaiah mm -hmm. said that. If you have that in front of you that you can look at, well, then Revelations is not hard at all. But uh, if you don't have it, then so what's the question? You're going to spend how much time are you going to spend in, in the Old Testament prophetic books as part of helping us and helping people understand Revelation? So you don't have a question about the book then. Okay, Rebecca. Why is Revelation so scary to me? Mm. Um, scary in the sense of I really don't like what sounds to me like a fulfillment of God's promise of a reward. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Restate the question. I mean, it scares me, and mm -hmm. I don't want things to end that way. Why do they end that way? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is, it, it, the book gives a sense of the end of all things, so why does it end that way? Okay. On a dim note. On a dim note, okay. Hmm. It's a very good question, and I think we'll we'll get to that as we this you know go into the type of literature it is, and looking at what the author is intending to do with the imagery he's using. Which, as Steve pointed out, um, we will be addressing John's use of the Old Testament. I think that's in three or four weeks, and we'll be looking at next week. Well, lesson three will be the type of literature. The revelation is because that's important to understand it's the type of literature that we don't write anymore really and we don't really deal with but it is everywhere in the ancient world and so there is a 
way to read it, just like we would read poetry different than we read history, and we read history different than we read an epistle. Um, the genre will help us understand how to interpret it. So I've seen a couple hands. Morgan, you were next, and then I think it's Bright, Paco, and Steve. Morgan? Okay. I just said the names. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it was Bright. Sorry. Bright? Okay, so Brad's question is, how soon is soon? When we read there in the first verse there, which they'll be coming up shortly. Paco? Mine was more like Rebecca's. Why is it so like misunderstood by everybody? Mm. Like what verses here make people think it's saying like end of times, end of the world? You know, like there's some secrets that we have to unravel. Mm -hmm. And what's the actual truth? Mm -hmm. So yeah. Why why is it so mis uh, why is it so easily misunderstood? Which fun little fact uh, we're going to see next week. And we might have time to get to it today. Ignatius of Lyons. Uh, he's a second century writer. He was having to deal with people who were claiming, yeah, John said the Antichrist is going to appear, and Leon's goes, no, he didn't. If he, if, he, if he thought proper to reveal who the Antichrist is, which they thought there was one, the Bible doesn't teach one, but he would have revealed it at the, in the Apocalypse. But as it is, we're not going to try and identify him because the Bible doesn't identify him. So it's an angel problem that we're going to kind of see why that happens. Uh, Chuck, then Dakota. I know the Bible's written for everybody to understand, but after doing some really good research, one of the main comments was this was written at a time that people understood the apocalyptic mm -hmm. uh, signs that were being given, uh, so it was easy for them to understand all of these signs that Jesus was showing to John. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the question was, it was, it was written for everybody, but it was it written just for the people at that time. Yeah, so what, what carries over, what is the impact for today? Um, so, Dakota. So I don't know how to form this into a question, but I hope this gives information. Okay. So I know I definitely Maybe there are other people out there like this. I know it's apocalyptic language. I know it's symbolic. Yeah. I don't really have any frame of reference. So that's definitely an area that I would have a lot of questions, but I don't even know enough to ask a question mm -hmm. about that. Second question, that's actually a question I have, <coughs> is how important in Revelation is it getting into the details? Because you see a lot of commentaries I'll read where they're like, talking about each color and like how symbolic that is and like how important is that mm -hmm. all of those little details or is it just like a general message okay so i want to kind of preview of coming attractions when we deal with the genre of revelation so best way to read revelation this is why i said i want y'all to try and read it as as fast as possible it's meant to be read in one sitting and if you read it in that hour setting you don't have time to get lost in the trees. You get a feeling for the big picture, which I'm, you know, Zach, you can say no, but I'm, you know, you guys read through it Monday night. What was your initial impression? Um, um, what I tried to do listening through it mm -hmm. is just, I had a notepad where I had a chapter, mm -hmm. each chapter, and just tried to notate something that stood out. Okay. Either like, that's weird to hear mm. that phrase. Um, also, things like, I've heard that phrase four times now. Mm. Um, so that was kind of a question that I was going to get to is, is there anything to be said for the patterns we see? Phrases like, he who has a ear, let him hear, mm. or it is done, or are they just simply um, in the text because it's part of the context. Okay, so I'll deal with both of these just real quick as preview of coming attraction. So, um, 
One of the things about apocalyptic literature, and you see this as Steve brought up, uh, the other books in our Bible that fall underneath this category are the back half of Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Matthew 24, I believe it's Mark 13, and Luke 22. Uh, the Jerusalem discourses in our Bibles uh, and the Gospels are known as little apocalypses because Jesus uses that type of literature in those sections to pronounce judgment upon Jerusalem. Ezekiel, back half of Daniel, and Zechariah um, are visions of things not yet to be happened. So, some quick things in apocalyptic literature, some broad strokes, and we're going to get into this in the next couple weeks, is one, normally they involve almost exclusively an otherworldly vision. The writer is taken someplace else, okay? Ezekiel is shown a glimpse of the glory of God, and he sees the wheel and the wheel and the wheel and the, and the throne of God. Um, Jesus is God himself, so that one doesn't really have the otherworldly vision, but Jesus is revealing what is going to be happening in the Jerusalem discourses. Uh, Daniel sees the vision of one like a son of man at the right hand of God. And what they do is, and these are broad strokes, the person who has been taken to the otherworldly place then tries to communicate in the best language possible, which is incommunica incommunicable. That's a word. How would you try and describe God if you saw him? I don't know where to start. We barely have a rough concept of who God is, and that's only because of what he's told us about himself, right? Um, you know? Um, Revelation, for example, talks about Jerus the new Jerusalem being like a street, you know, streets made with gold and all these jewels and all that stuff. Um, and some of us, some of the Christians in times past, I think, have gotten the completely wrong idea from that. Um, you know, we sing at him mansions over the hilltop. I, I, want, a, I want a gold mansion that's silver lined. Nah, I think that misses the point. Gold is going to be the equivalent of dirt in heaven. Something we, we consider so valuable here on earth pales in comparison to the glory that will be heaven and God. So, so there's that. They're trying to communicate, which is hard to communicate. And what the main message of apocalyptic literature does is it's normally given to a people who are afflicted and oppressed. And the message, no matter if it's Ezekiel or Daniel or the intertestament period of apocalyptic literature, the message is, be faithful. God is going to bring about deliverance soon. He's going to bring about judgment. You are going to be vindicated. Real quick, who remembers where Ezekiel was when he saw the vision? He was on the river Chabar, I think it was, with the exiles, having just left Jerusalem. They're dwelling in tents by a river. Jerusalem has just been destroyed by Gentiles and the enemies of God. I think that's a people that needs to hear a message that God is going to vindicate the righteous and punish the wicked, that he is going to deliver you. So that's, that's that background there. So, but in apocalyptic literature, most of the details, most, not all, are sometimes just window dressing. Because you really... If the author wants you to understand what this means, the author tells you. Daniel had questions about the vision, and the angel said, I will tell you what this means, what this means. And does the same thing with Ezekiel, does the same thing with Zechariah. Let the reader understand. That's familiar. So, um, that's just a quick, we've gotten on a rabbit hole and that's okay. Uh, but, apocalyptic literature is trying to paint a vivid picture in our minds. It's meant to be imaginative in that, not pretend, but it's supposed to evoke these big images and these, these terrifying and wonderful scenes um, for us to get it. It'd be like, well, like I said, being in class, it's like John's trying to write a blockbuster before te TV and film even existed, okay? This, this great imaginative scene that's going on. So, anyway, we need to get back to just talking about our questions and stuff. I saw a couple hands over here, so Rochelle and then Diana. 
Um, one of the questions that I had was reading through it, I felt like there was kind of a stop between him talking about the seven churches of, of Asia and going into the next portion of the chapter. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I missed it or what, but what is or is there a correlation between the seven churches of, of Asia and the rest of the book? Mm. So we're celebrating a really good question, and we'll get into it, but there is, there is definitely a market leech. There's a big change once we get done with the seven churches, and then we go into the rest of the book. Um, Rich House question was, there, is there a correlation? I think there is. And that goes back to genre. I know we just said it's apocalyptic. But it's actually more than apocalyptic. Okay? So the reason why we spend so much time in the seven churches of Asia is because we're familiar with that genre of literature. They're epistles. They read just like Ephesians and Colossians and Philippians. We get that. That's why we preach on them so much, because mm -hmm. like, they're not scary. <laughs> uh, you know, we get that. But also, Revelation is part poetic. There's poetic parts in Revelation. It's also part liturgy. That is called worship. There is a theme throughout the book that we can get into that if you look at the commands that Jesus gives to the Christians, it is to give honor to God, to worship the Lamb, to give glory and praise to the Lamb who was slain and who was now vindicated. <clears throat> Revelation can also be read as a call to faithful worship of God in an unfaithful generation. So it's part liturgy. It's also part prophetic. And it's part apocalyptic. It's, it's, a, it's a hybrid genre, if you will, but overwhelmingly it's apocalyptic. Uh, but there's elements that we already understand which should be encouraging to us. That means we're that much more equipped to understand the book. We know how to read Psalms, right? I hope you do. We know how to read epistles. <clears throat> we're sometimes comfortable with prophets. So we're already familiar with some of the genres there. So, bam. I don't mean to be disrespectful at all mm -hmm. because we're talking about God's revelation and His Word. Mm -hmm. But going through it, I see that God wins, Satan loses. And the question is, it doesn't have to do with my salvation. Why would I find it necessary to so deeply study mm -hmm. that confuses a lot of Christians and causes more? discourse than it does edification. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. They ask question for the class. I mean, just to repeat for the class. You know, and you hit the nail on the head for the overall message of the book. Saint loses, God wins. As people are vindicated. And yet, it causes so much confusion. It causes a lot of division. One could argue, is, it's, is, is it absolutely necessary for our salvation of correct understanding on it? I think we could go, I think there's common arguments being made both ways on that. Um, as a preacher, I'm kind of biased one way or the other, but that's just me. So the question is, why, do we spend, why would we spend so much time studying it? And my answer to that is going to be is Revelation is, it, it has two goals, as we'll see when we start studying the background and everything. One is, it's a call to faithfulness to a generation of Christians that have become lukewarm, apathetic, and indifferent. Oh, that doesn't sound like us at all, does it? But also, Revelation is an overt critique of the Roman Empire. And I'm just going to throw this out here as something to chew on. If you read studies of Revelation by our brethren globally, especially in the Global South, South America, Central America, they have seen applicable lessons from this book and critiques from this book that would apply equally to the United States. Because we're going to see in Revelation, it is about the first century Christians, but its critiques and calls out of abuses of power and sin fits any country, any people that would wear the shoes of Babylon. Uh, who would want to squash Christianity, who would want to say, you don't need to believe that. You, you need to start towing the line. And where, here are, here's where I think really we have a really big section of application. We're in a culture 
that I think we're done with the whole, well, you just believe that and it's okay, we'll just stay over here. No, now it's overtly now, if you don't believe the way we do, we're going to ostracize you, we're going to make a social pariah out of you, and we're going to make sure that the rest of the country knows that you are not to be liked. Okay? So I'm jumping into stuff next week, but here's a likely timeline of what happened. Christianity for the first half of the first century, relatively few problems. I say that relatively. Persecution is localized, and it's largely dependent on the whims of the governor of where he's at, until Nero becomes emperor. Nero is the first top-down persecution of Christians. According to church tradition, both Peter and Paul suffered martyrdom at the hands of Nero. Nero, according to Suetonius, who is a pagan writer, not a Christian, was wicked as all get out. He was so wicked that even the Romans didn't like him, and they killed their own emperor, and they put somebody else in his place. That sparked what was known as the year of the four emperors. Empire is thrown into chaos because everyone and their mother's uncle is trying to become emperor. And you go through four emperors in one year, them getting assassinated one after another. During that year, persecuting Christians really isn't a concern because everyone's fighting for power. Then you get the Flavian dynasty. And, and what ends up happening is Vespasian and Titus, the two emperors that precede Domitian, are too busy really to care about Christians. Vespasian is dealing with other issues of solidifying power. Uh, Titus is having to deal with the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Um, there's a lot of problems internally in Italy. Domitian is the younger brother of Titus and the, and the son of Vespasian. He was never supposed to be emperor. When he ascends to the throne, he has no military conquest. He has no experience politically. He's a mentally unstable, power-hungry brute of a man. And what do brutes do when they get power? They try and solidify their power. And what ends up happening is he gets paranoid that everyone's plotting against him. And so he started doing state um, religious trials, basically. Anyone that was brought before him or his court was obligated to offer a sacrifice as a test of loyalty to his image. And if you didn't, you were found guilty of the crime of atheism. Which, interestingly enough, according to Dio, the third century historian, Roman historian, atheism was partly defined in the Roman world as being carried off into Jewish tradition. So a lot of Christians died because the Romans didn't care if you were Jew or Christian. You all were weird and you worshipped one God and you didn't engage in the excesses that Roman religion did. And just a little glimpse into how crazy Domitian was. One of his contemporaries noted that he would often lock himself in his office for hours to catch flies so he could stab them with pins. This is the type of, like, sadistic mindset we're dealing with in Domitian. Suetonius, again, pagan author, says he, was more, he wasn't just wicked. He was crafty and manipulative. He was totally aware of his own, of his own depravity and wickedness. Okay? So... Back to the timeline. Persecution happens in 70 AD. Christians get a reprieve because Rome is in chaos. Domitian shows up and that reprieve is over. And now we're seeing renewed, intense persecution specifically to the seven churches of Asia because in that region of the Roman Empire that was a hotbed for imperial worship. And Domitian restores the imperial cult. Titus and Vespasian like tacitly was okay with that. They had other problems to deal with. Domitian overtly ramped up, built up, and was, went all in on the imperial cult to where Suetonius again says that Domitian insisted upon his subjects calling him Lord and God. Now, I hope we see where that would be an issue for Christians. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, Romans 10.9, even though the perse persecution probably served more as a political tool, 
No Christian in good conscience could swear that loyalty. And so what ends up happening, as we see today, when cultural hot points happen, is some Christians, after the first wave of persecution, double down. We need to be faithful. We cannot engage in this culture. We have to call out the evils, the sins. We must be faithful to Jesus. Other groups of Christians got gun shy. We've been saying Hebrews, okay? They had already undergone one wave of persecution in Hebrews 10, right? They had their property seized, some their, their wealth taken away, and they're afraid. And so they're shrinking back. So you have one group of Christians said, let's not rock the boat. Go ahead. Did you, you, you can buy meat in the idol's market. It's, it's just an idol. Go ahead, bank in the tu- temple of Jupiter. Well, you can swear loyalty to, to Caesar as long as you don't really mean it. And what the problem really is in Revelation isn't so much overt Roman persecution. It's the church being in danger of becoming too much like the world. It was a, it, those church, these churches in, in Asia were in danger of losing their saltiness per Rome, uh, Matthew chapter 5. Because we see with Ephesus, they've lost their first love. You see at others, they've become lukewarm. Other churches were tolerating false teachers. Other churches just didn't care. And I know I'm ranting now or going on at a little bit of a side note here, but and all this will be repeated in more briefer next week and you'll have an outline and notes, so don't worry about trying to write this all down. Why is Revelation important for us today? I would suggest to you that we're living in a similar culture that wants us to bow the knee, that wants us to not make waves, that wants us to simply agree with whatever the culture says is morally right. And there will be many brethren who will say, well, as long as you don't believe it, that's okay. You can go along with that. And Jesus would call us to radical discipleship of standing firmly on his truth, uncompromising on what it teaches. You know, I was just listening to a podcast yesterday, and the, the guys made this point. They're, they're talking about, should Christians boycott Target? And they They made some good arguments, not really because that just throws kerosene on that movement's fire. It pretty much shows that movement. Everything they thought about this is true. And the author, the podcaster made the point, says, I think that misses the point, too, because while everyone's over here focusing on the alphabet soup mess, here's the other problem. Cohabitation is an all-time high in this country. Divorce rates are at an all-time high. More Americans now will not be married versus married. Adultery is rampant. And here's the problem. When was the last time you heard any sort of moral outrage from the right or evangelicalism about those issues? Well, here, but in general. And I would say part of how the churches are showing that we've lost our saltiness is Satan has gone us to focus on the one sexual sin of homosexuality and we're ignoring four, five, six, eight, ten others. When really, and this is where the, the claim of hypocrisy happens is, the, the assimilation is already beginning in this country, okay? And we have to be careful about that. So I have robbed enough of your time in class uh, so, write down those questions, please. We will talk about that. So, um, we've already kind of dealt with the initial impressions as we've talked about these questions. In the last couple minutes of class, I just want to see what do you, and we've touched on this a little bit, but what do you think your biggest challenges are to understand this book? We've already talked about, you know, I, I know it's called apocalyptic. I really don't know what that means. Okay, we're going to be dealing with that, so hopefully we can get rid of that challenge. Um, and our question was, well, what about all the details? Do they matter? It seems like we're going into too, too much detail on the details. Again, we're going to have a whole class devoted just to that question. Um, 
But any other things that kind of popped up in your initial survey and study that seemed to be a challenge to understanding the book? Rebecca, then Paul. I do not, I'm not asking a question about numbers as mm -hmm. per your instruction, but I am wondering about the sense of limitation and exclusion that is indicated by specific amounts. Why? So a question about more of what are the numbers meaning in the book or? It's not, it's not about meaning. Mm -hmm. It's about is there a purpose in using limited quantities across the board in Revelations because that challenges my understanding of its application for today. What would be an example if you don't mind? Um, Limited to thinking in thousands, limited to um, understanding partial sec sections of humanity, not just non-believers versus mm -hmm. believers, but specific portions. Right, so uh, a couple examples come to my mind, so probably like why the 144,000, why that multiple, why a third, a third, and a third during the scenes of judgment, uh, because, you know, for example, if a giant meteorite hit the Earth, more than just a third would be destroyed. You know, so we'll we'll get into that. So why why the proportionality of the numbers? Okay, that's good. Um, Paul and then Steve. I think the two biggest challenges to understanding Revelation are, at least for me, uh, having having been told to what what to think it means. Mm. Right. So. You need, to, you need to approach it with fresh eyes. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is uh, people don't understand Revelation because they don't read the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So as our brother Paul pointed out, um, and this is a big challenge, if we're going to have to challenge ourselves to overcome it, is we have brought a lot to the text already that we don't know that we brought, if that makes sense. Uh, Tom Hamilton made the point one time that oftentimes when we study the Bible, we get out of a verse what we already brought to it, um, in that we already came with our conclusions, and we just look to see and, and find that and said, let the text speak for itself. So this is going to be really important of just letting the text speak for itself. And secondly, Paul is, hits it on the head, and Steve had talked about this at the beginning of class too, we don't know the language of the prophets, we don't know the Old Testament, as they did. And so there is difficulty. Hence why we're going to spend a whole class period talking about John's use of the Old Testament in the book of Revelation because it is, it's everywhere. Um, uh, and that should tell us something. Um, and we might be going to the Old Testament a little bit during our study of this to see how John might be using this imagery in order to make his point. Steve? God is a spirit, so... You can't see a spirit. So whenever God shows himself to man, there's always how he shows himself as part of a message, whether it's a burning bush or a flaming, spinning wind, or however he does it. The pictures drawn in Revelations are so powerful and so intricate. It's hard, it, it's easy to see that there's the, the primary message there, but how much of the details should we take? Right, and that, that is a challenge. So I do see their hands for like the last couple of seconds. I do need to get through a couple more things, so uh, save it for next time. So in Revelation, um, there are myriad approaches to the book. Um, this kind of outlines the guiding principles I will be teaching the book from. Okay, I'm not even going to waste time or class space to talk about some of the other approaches because honestly some of them are just, they're stupid. And I mean that in the full textbook definition of the word. Um, they're completely lacking sense. Um, exhibit A, Left Behind series. No. Just, no. Little, little fun fact. Rapture, Antichrist, does not appear anywhere in the book. I'm just going to get that out of the way, and I might repeat that several times. Rapture, Antichrist, do not appear in the book 
whatsoever, and the book has nothing to say about those things. So, I know that's the bell. I'm going to hold you just a little bit. We are going to understand the genre of Revelation. We're going to apply the same Bible study tools that we would any other book to this book. We're going to respect the historical context of the book as well. Okay? Um, this approach might be known as the historical method um, or the historical preterist, if you want to use that terminology. Uh, we're going to seek to study under Revelation with good reading and studying skills, and we're going to, our aim is to discover the universal truths of the book that are applicable to any generation. So if I do, I'm just going to say this up front, if I feel like we're having a triangle discussion or we're getting too lost in the weeds, I will end discussion to bring us back because we're going to be wasting more time than what's beneficial for us arguing about, well, I think the color of the horse of death means... The author doesn't say we don't know. Okay? Our focus is what is the impact, what is the message for believers of any age. Okay? We will be talking about some of that imagery, but this is the main thrust of the book. So there's a brief outline of um, lessons on the back. This is not determined how many weeks we're going to spend the book. It's just what lessons I have briefly sketched out. So thank you. Appreciate it. Please write the questions on the card and get those to me. Thank you.